I wish I had a, my mindset just shifted. My praise just shifted. Hallelujah. My thought process just shifted. I was not feeling well when I got here, but something just, hey God, something just shifted. How many of y'all know that there's healing in my house? There's healing in the building? Somebody shout, there's healing right where I'm at. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, glory. Give him glory. Give him glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Woo -wee. That's what I'm talking about. A midweek energized, right? Amen. A, a midweek. I mean, it's Tuesday night, but there is energy in the house. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, I just believe that that's what we need. Uh, uh, we need that, that midweek energy, right? We, we need that, that, that fresh new development of his power in our lives. Hallelujah. And you know what? Th that happens because of where you surrender and how you surrender. Oh, I just said something right there. It's where you surrender and how you surrender. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. See, I got a story, but I only made it through to this year because of how I surrendered and where I surrender. And some of us are surrendering our mind, our body, our soul, our spirit to the wrong ones. And so when we surrender to the wrong one, then we find ourselves struggling through this thing called life. Life is going to always give you challenges and circumstances, but you got to be reminded of who you are. Right? And, and, and know that you got a story. I, I believe I'm in a room right now with a bunch of people in this room now. I, I think I'm sitting around about 400 people right now that, that got a story. That you got a story, you got a testimony that you can just share with somebody that they were like, Lord, have mercy. How did you get through that thing right there? Only by the grace of God. Somebody shout hallelujah right there. Amen. Ain't nothing like the grace of God moving in our lives. Listen, y'all, I, I want to talk a few minutes of, uh, tonight about I got a story. Somebody say it out real loud. Somebody put it in the comment section, I got a story. All of us in this room, everybody watching online got a story. I mean, whatever your story is, you, you, got, a, you got a story. I mean, you, you got some things that, that God has brought you out of. You, have, you got a, a story where you have made some bad decisions and you had consequences because of those decisions. And then you turned around and gave your life to Jesus. And you discovered that uh, all this time, all I had to do was surrender to God. And things could have changed, turned around really pretty quickly, right? Uh, uh, I could find peace in my life um, if I would just repent and turn to God. I want to talk to y'all. Paul, in the book of Philippians chapter 3, we talked about it Sunday. And I, I want to revisit Sunday, amen, again tonight because I think it's important for us to understand the power of your story. Maybe that should have been the theme. The power of my story. <laughs> my, my story got power, right? Um, uh, because it, it shows how God has been operating when I was oscillating. In other words, I was kind of doing what I wanted to do while God was yet still operating in my life, right? And sometimes we forget when God or that God is actually working on your behalf because we're now all in our flesh. But I, I got a story to tell. I got, I got a story to tell because that's where my testimony comes from. It's through my story. You know, Paul talks about in the book of Philippians chapter 3, he was talking and, uh, you know, he was talking about uh, us as believers. He's telling the people, he says, to be aware. Right? You got you to be aware of dogs and evildoers and evil workers and, and all those things, right? And, um, and there's a reason why he wants us to be aware because he doesn't want us to fall prey to darkness. All of us have had that. That's, that's in our story. How many of y'all know that darkness is in your story, right? All of us got some darkness in our story because we are flesh. We were born in sin, and it was easy to sin because we have a sin nature. And out of that sin nature, then we make decisions that's based on our emotions opposed to based on our spirituality. And it's difficult to move into spirituality if you never get in the word of God to discover who you really are. If you really want to know who you are, then you got to get in the word of God. Because all of us are, are mortal. We are, we are flesh. But yet the spirit of God lives in us. So we are spirit. 
right? We are the temple of God. So that's why the Bible says that we're made in his image and in his likeness. We don't look alike, but we all still have the Zoe in us. We have the Ruach. We have the breath of God in us, right? Because when we die, that breath leaves our body. So it goes back to its maker, who is God. So now this shell is just who I was, but yet I yet live with Christ, right? Because of my relationship and my confession of faith of who Christ is in my life. Everybody don't believe that, I do. So now y'all got to remember that we are in a world system. And I, I need y'all to hear this because I, I think it's, it's important for us to get this, that uh, somebody look up the, uh, in the word, uh, look up uh, uh, Psalm 61. Uh, uh, I'm going to look at a couple of verses there. Somebody look that up real quick. Um, but we got to remember we live in a world that has all types of narratives. And if we're not careful, we will embrace a world system narrative. Are y'all saying with me? So if, if you are not solid in Christ, you can be opened to any and any other kind of narratives or doctrines. And these narratives come in different ways, okay? So all of us have a family narrative. People say you're going to be like your mother, be like your father. You're going to drink like them. Yeah, I wish people would start talking about you're going to be wealthy like your daddy was or wealthy like your mama was or wealthy like your great granddaddy was. Somebody have to have some wealth somewhere along that bloodline. Then why does it always have to be a narrative that I'm going to be an alcoholic? Y'all ain't going to say nothing. Is my mic working tonight? Why does it always have to be that I'm going to be a, a drug addict or a, a prostitute or a, a, or a vagabond? Why can't, it, why can't you praise, place a narrative in me that says I am going to be somebody in Christ? That I'm going to be a prophet, I'll be a pastor, I'll be an apostle, I'll, I'll be a CEO, or I'll be a doctor or a lawyer. I, I mean, I don't mean just saying it, but helping me reach that place. So we got to be very careful of our family narratives. Then there's those cultural narratives. And those cultural narratives, uh, they can sometimes say that you'll never be able to be something because you're black. I don't agree with that. <laughs> because I, I look at people around me that's black, that's wealthy, that's happy, right? That's married, that have children, right? So just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm halted. <laughs> so be careful of the narrative that goes in your head because the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So you have to be careful of the family narratives, the cultural narratives, and the church narratives. That sometimes in church, we tend to make people think that you just need to come to church and just everything is all right. And it's bigger than that. You need to come to church because the Bible says, stay with Lewis tonight. I know, I know y'all probably bored, but that's all right. You better get this in your spirit because you're going to need it later on. Because there's a church narrative that says that I need to show up and praise and give. But that's not the narrative we need to hear. We need to hear the narrative. Not only am I showing up, but I'm also in his presence. And in his presence, then I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. I need a narrative that tells me that I have to have the power of the Holy Ghost if I want some better things in my life. If I really want to walk in this spiritual journey and be the man and you want to be the woman that God called you to be, then you're going to have to operate by the Spirit of God uh, with the power of the Holy Ghost. And sometimes in our narrative, we don't want to talk about the third person of the triune God. We have to discuss him because he's the one that's going to guide us. He's the one that's comforting us. He's the one that's exhorting us. But if we don't know nothing about him, we'll never be able to go to a rock that's higher than I. Y'all don't want to say nothing. That's, I, 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 I got to teach because I need you. I, 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 and I need to keep it practical because as a drug dealer, I never thought I'd be a preacher. As a matter of fact, I had an issue with a preacher that I was going to shoot him and kill him. Uh, um, yeah, for reasons that at that particular time was beyond my control, but my emotions got in the way simply because I'm a man of the street. So as a man of the street, so I said I would never be a preacher because of what that preacher did. 
So that narrative caused me not to even want to go to church because there's people that got church hurt, for, church hurt for different reasons. I had church hurt, but look where I'm at today. I got a story to tell. <laughs> I got a real story to tell you. Amen. And, and, and the interesting thing was that the church took up for him when he was wrong. I had a problem with that. Can I be transparent for a moment? Yeah, that's where I was at that time. So I never, I told God when I didn't, I only knew God and Jesus. I didn't know nothing about the Holy Ghost. So I told God I, I would never step foot in another church. Never knowing that he already had a plan for me to be a preacher. I did not have a clue. Are y'all saying, I got a story to tell. That's why you need to give me just a little credit that I made it through some stuff that should have kept me out of church in the first place. But God still had a story and a plan because he said, your thoughts are not mine. Your ways are not mine. Oh, no, my thoughts are higher than yours. My ways are not your ways. So God had a strategy that I had nothing to do with. <laughs> See, God will do, start doing stuff in your life when you least expect it. Yeah, you got a story to tell. So in the midst of that, uh, in the midst of this testimony, then I realized that this story tells how merciful God is and how graceful God. Matter of fact, all y'all in this room, all y'all watching online right now, you better, you ought to just take about five seconds and give God praise for the mercy that he showed up on your jacked up life. You ought to just take about five more seconds and give God praise for the grace that he showed up on your life. There are some times that you were like me, that you were way out of line with God. Hallelujah. And you did not understand. You didn't have a relationship with God, but God still had a plan. Amen. The Bible tells me in the book of, uh, of Psalms uh, 61, verses 1 through 4, what does it talk about there, uh, uh, right? So, so y'all got to remember this now. Now, God's trying to lead us to a higher place. Um, uh, Paul talks about pressing on, right? Pressing on. And sometimes we find ourselves in a low place, but God can't pick you up and take you to a higher place. Now, read what the Scripture says in Psalms 61, verses 1 through 4. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. So here is the writer saying, now, Lord, I I'm in a place. And, and, and he says, what does he say? He said, hear my cry. All of us have a story. And you'll find yourself in a place where you need help. Amen. And sometimes we seek help from man before we will seek help from God. Paul, the writer, is telling us, he says, now, hear my cry, O God. Yeah. Attend to my prayer. So the first thing he says, now, God, here I am. I don't know where else to go. I'm between a rock and a hard place. So would you hear my prayer? So what is the writer telling us? He's telling us the first thing we need to learn how to do in this season is learn how to pray. We need to learn how to cry out to God and let God hear your voice in heaven. And so God can send down all the help that you need. Don't y'all know he has legions of angels? That's against the legions of demons that's trying to stop you. But if you ain't praying, you'll never experience experience the open door because prayer with prayer is the is the gatekeeper to breakthrough prayer is the gatekeeper to miracles prayer is the gatekeeper here it is here it is to to your next chapter you've got to pray somebody said you got to pray the bible says to pray without ceasing right paul tells us he said but i press Right. He says, though, he says, though, now I, I had everything going on in my life. I was a I, I, I was a man. But Paul said now in the midst of all of that, he says now he says in verse 12, this is I'm sorry. I'm kind of running around here. I promise you, this is so much in my spirit right now. It's just crazy. Amen. I'm trying to trying to bring keep some order here because I got a story to tell. And, and, and I'm trying to tell it through Paul because Paul is giving direction. He's giving foundation for all of us to stand on. And that's why y'all can't allow the narratives of the world system to get in the way of your relationship with God. 
Y'all got all these preachers. You got all kind of stuff on TV, all kind of stuff on social media. You got people coming in your ear. Those are narratives that's not, listen, you need to take, the Bible says test the spirit by the spirit. The Bible says to taste and see that the Lord is, is good. So he's saying that when those narratives come to you, you need to take them back to the word. Am I making sense to you? Because if you don't, you won't keep pressing. Look at what Paul said. Paul said in verse 12 of Philippians 3, he says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of, of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and, here it is, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Now, here is Paul letting you know that you're going to have some, some, some days that pain will be remembered. You will, some things will spark some hurtful things that came in your life. And I know it's hard to forget stuff, isn't it? It's, it's hard. Yeah, because I got a mind. I got a memory. I'm in my flesh. But I, I've, I've got to let it go. Because if I don't, it'll hold me back. Right? I, 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 I wish I, if, if I'd have had my backpack tonight and I'd have had a, a whole bunch of bricks on it and I'd have had you walking around here with all those things that just broke your heart, that hurt your feelings before you came to Christ, those things that's trying to keep you down and keep you broke, busting, and disgusted, I'd have let you walk around here. You probably wouldn't have made it around this room four times, two times because of the weight. What's the purpose of that? The purpose of it is that you can see the weight that you carry when God is trying to give, tell you to get, cast your cares upon me because I care for you, right? I'm, I'm trying to help your story. I'm trying to help your next chapter, right? So in order for me to be able to press on, I've got to let go of the weight. The Bible says lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets you. So what is the sin? What is the thing, the, the thing that has been keeping you from walking with God? What is that one thing or that two things, right? Those are the things you need, to cast, you need to cast to God because those things don't want you to press, as the Bible says, press toward the, mark, toward the goal for the prize of the hopeful call in God through Christ Jesus. So, so now, check this out. So if, if I go back to Philipp, uh, uh, Psalm 61 and and the chief musician says this. He says, now, from the end of the earth, this is verse 2 in uh, Psalm 61, from the end of the earth, I will cry to you. So the writer is saying that, listen, all the way until the day I die, I'm going to always call on you. That's one person that you can always reach. Y'all know you got best friends, you got family members, you have husbands, wives, and, you know, you got pastors, and you got all this. But, you know, there's times when they, we got to sleep. But when you wake up in the midnight hour and you're going through pressure, that's when you can call out on, G, on God. And God will hear your cry. I know this is elementary, but y'all better get it because sometimes we get so caught up in prophecy that we forget the prophecy won't work because you ain't got a foundation. Did y'all hear me online? Did that make? Did anybody hear me online? Because if we ain't careful, we're going to chase a word and ain't got nothing to put the word on. <laughs> they talk a little, I ain't going to say that. No. <laughs> From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart, listen, is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Somebody shout, lead me to the rock, God. That is higher than I. So who is this rock that's higher than you? Jesus, right? Jesus says, I am, he says, upon this, he tells you, let's check this out. This is interesting. He says in the book of Matthew, he says, he says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail again. See, you got a story to tell. And the reason why you're still here is because that rock represents confession. Right? He says, upon this rock, upon your confession, watch this, it's another one, and upon your a profession that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life, upon this rock I will build my... See, God can build when you confess. 
Watch this. God can build when you are convicted. See, a lot of times people stop coming around you because they get too convicted. That's why you don't have the same friends that you used to have. Because conviction will either draw you or drive you. And that's one thing that God does. Whenever you come in the presence of God, you're going to get convicted. Did y'all see Sunday here at New Season Church? It was so many men and women that was weeping in the presence of God. And not to say that all of it was conviction, but what it showed me was that there's so much of God's presence in the house. That no matter how they came in here, they must have some heaviness somewhere, amen, in their story, that God began to lift that weight off of them. Glory to God. Whoo, Jesus. And I'm looking around the room, and I'm saying to myself, good God Almighty, look at the power of God moving through the building. Everybody may not have saw that, but that's what I'd be looking at. I'd be like, where's the Holy Ghost moving at? Where the angels landing at? And I look around the room, the angels landing on the heads and on arms and on bodies, on kidneys and upon cancer. Come on up, upon diabetes and high blood pressure, low blood pressure. Uh, 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 Stacy was upstairs and she didn't have no reading on her blood pressure. She pressed her way through and came to church and started serving God. Next thing I know, I seen her up there jumping with her hands up. Why? Because the angels of God was le laying on her. Come on up in here. Leaning in her direction. Come on up in here. God God is leaning. Somebody shout, God is leaning in my direction. You got to get in a place to know that God has your best interest at heart. Somebody ought to know that conviction is good. Because what conviction does, it causes you to admit. And it's only when you admit when you then say, God, I allow you in. See, you can't allow God in with, until you admit some stuff. See, because without the admission, then there's no, that means that, so if, 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 if I got a, a, a stony heart, and this, you know, so this is like a brick wall. I'm just trying to paint a picture for y'all. This is like a brick wall. So until I surrender or convicted and, and admit, then that's when I allow this wall to be broken. And when that wall is broken, then my heart is exposed. So now God can come in. And like the scripture said, he says, leave, he says that when my heart is overwhelmed. And sometimes when we're overwhelmed, then we're trying to cover our own hearts. And we, oh, Lord, I just heard this one. God said, and what you're doing, you're trying to cover your heart with your own scars. And so when you're trying to cover what I created with your pain, You'll never, with scar tissue, you'll never be able to get the healing that you need. Because now you got a Band-Aid on something that needs surgery. Take the Band-Aid off. Hey, 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 come on. You got a Band-Aid on something that needs surgery. And that surgery comes through God. And, and the writer said, he says, Lord, he says, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is high, higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me. D d d write this down. God will, just write it down, God will be your shelter. Yeah, yeah, God, God will be your shelter. Right when you think that, uh, um, you know, you're about to get overwhelmed with the pressures of life and with the storms of life, and then God says, I will come and I'll be your shelter. Or if I'm your shelter, that means he's also your refuge, right? And, and we see that all through Scripture where God is saying, I'll be your, he says, I'll be your present help. In a time of trouble. And so when we know that, then um, that's when we embrace him. So um, all of our lives, y'all, is just made up of all kinds of stories. Um, we got stories from our childhood. We got stories playing sports. We got stories in churches. Uh, we got stories uh, at the bank. We got stories um, uh, from the grocery stores. We got stories from uh, friends, enemies. We got all kinds of stories. But God is wanting to, to transform your narratives of how you tell your story. Because if we don't allow God to transform our narratives, we will find ourselves in a place to where we're always seeking attention. And then we have this attention-getting spirit. And because we like attention, we never get the healing that we need. Because sometimes we like the negative attention, then we do the praise. 
Some people like to be sick. So, some, some, some people like to be down. It's unfortunate, but it's true. That's their narrative. That's their end. That's their attention. If I ever get healed, then I'm going to lose attention. So, so God wants to transform that narrative to where you're glorifying him that he healed you. And now you can help somebody else heal because heal people, heal people. Right? Hurt people, keep hurting people. <laughs> and so every time you get going through something, you go to somebody already hurt, next thing you know, both y'all in the dungeon drinking at the same time. Blind. The Bible talks about that. Because you never got hurt and it got healed, but you think you can help somebody come out of a hurt place or dark place, but yet you never came out yourself. Then the next thing you know, both y'all crying and ain't, ain't nobody crying with praise. We just crying. Just going deeper and deeper. We making the, we making the sand uh, quicksand. All them tears just soaking the sand in, and now y'all just sinking deeper and deeper, faster and faster. It ain't just one of you, now it's two of you. Lord, have mercy. Hallelujah. Gee, let me, let me stop talking. So why don't you operate as a healed people? And we operate by, through being a healed people by st spending time with the healer. Right? By my, by my stripes, you are healed. But if we don't believe that word and we like drama or attention, then you're discarding that very thing that when you get it in you can change you. Oh, Lord, I'm just kind of all over the place tonight. <laughs> kinda, I'm kinda, I got a story. So I was, I was injured. I was wounded, right? And in my wounds, I, had, I didn't want nothing to do with none of y'all. This was before y'all came along. This was before I became a preacher. I didn't want to have nothing to do with no church because I was wounded, right? And so I didn't want to read the word because I was wounded. But if, if watch this. If I would had one of those church people come to me and have a conversation, I probably wouldn't have been wounded so long. And the problem is that we, prof we confess being Christians, but we won't love our brother and pick our brother up when our brother is down. Back then, nobody came to pick me up because they knew I was half crazy anyway. They wouldn't come pick me up because they probably were scared of me. But at the same time, if you had enough Holy Ghost in you, you should have been brave enough to go to that crazy man and say, wait a minute, son, listen to me. Let God have your pain and watch. And so if you start praying, you might change that preacher's heart. So he'll quit cheating. Yeah, y'all didn't want to hear that part. So the church has to be more than just a Sunday morning. It has to be a relational place. The church has to be a relational place that is not afraid, watch this, to uh, engage with the injured. We can't be afraid to, listen, we're supposed to be a place where people come to get healing. So if, if the healing ain't here, Latoria, then ain't nobody else going to come back no more. Come on up in here. Amen. Just this past Sunday, we seen two people that's been coming to this church for over a month and made a decision to give their life to Jesus and rededicate their life to Jesus because of church hurt. They didn't want to have nothing else to do with the church, but they came up in this house. I wish I had a witness in here. They came up in this house and said, wait a minute, I feel the presence of God, and it's just different now. Why? Because they felt the relationships from y'all toward them through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that all that church hurt, that they were going through all the deaths that they went through, that, listen, it got covered by the blood. Because word is taught. Come on up in here. Come, come closer to me. 
Because word is taught. If word ain't taught, then they would have walked out of here, right, feeling the same old way. But Sunday after Sunday, they kept coming up in here. And for a month or two months, they came up in here, and the next thing they knew, things had to shift and things had to change. Hallelujah. And that's because they had a mindset for change. They wanted more out of their life. I wish people would come to church and want more out of your life. Come on up in here. You got a story to tell, and you ought to want more when you come to church. I ain't just coming to church just to see pastor and see what people are driving and just what they singing. I come to get in the presence of God because I got a story when I walked up in here Sunday morning and I was injured. Amen. And I didn't need a band-aid. I needed healing. Yes. Come on up in here somebody. I don't need to be, I don't need to be judged. I need to be healed. I, I don't need to be, I don't need to be ridiculed. I need to be loved. That's what I need. And so if you will be receptive to the love of God, then you will experience the healing of God. You got to be receptive. Somebody shout, you got to be receptive. And you got to change your narrative. And the more words you put in you, the more your narratives will change when they're negative. Change it. Sometimes you got to change your circle because they ain't talking right. Every time I turn around, we having a good conversation. Somehow or another, it ends up on, on negative stuff. Have y'all ever had them kind of conversations with people? I mean, y'all having a great conversation, and all of a sudden, man, you excited, and, and they excited. They starting to change it, then all of a sudden, they shift the whole atmosphere. And before you know it, y'all hang up the phone. You hung up, hang up the phone and be like, what in the world just happened? You weak, you got a headache and everything. You, you know what I mean? You, you done lost your appetite and everything else because that spirit jumped on you. Quit letting other people's oh here it is. Quit letting other people's spirits jump on you. Come on, you need to hang up the phone when you have finished talking about what you need to talk about and tell them to shut it down. Sometimes people need to just shut up. <laughs> Y'all got to remember when you're talking to people, you got to be you got to remember this um, that that's the time that um, God is up to something. I remember back when I was uh, growing up and uh, my grandmama. Whenever she hear light, my mama would do it too. If she hear lightning, if it start thundering, she turning everything off. Ain't no TV gonna be on. Ain't no radio gonna be radio going. She turn off the lights and everything and tell everybody. Everybody in this house need to sit down somewhere and be still because it's thundering and lightning outside. Y'all ever been there before? And I come to tell some people tonight that you might need to just sit down somewhere because God is doing a work in your life. But if you don't sit down long enough, you'll never experience the power of God. God is up to something. <laughs> heaven is, my grandma used to say, heaven is shouting tonight. <laughs> God, is, God is crying because his heart is broken for, this, for, for what he's burdened for. That's what the church needs to have as a burden for the lost. Hmm. The confused, the sick. We need to have a burden. And my mom, even grandma, she said, she said, when it's raining, that's God crying from heaven over this land. And he's going to cry so much, he's going to cause the flowers to grow. He's going to cry. He gonna cry. Yeah, have y'all ever known? I be watering my plants and stuff on a daily basis. But it seems like when it rains from heaven and that water hits my plants, it's like all of a sudden, man, they be like growing overnight. I be like, Lord, you can rain more if you want to because it, that rain water got something else in it. I wish I had a witness in here. So whenever the rain from heaven comes down, it does something to the grass, it does something to the flowers, and it also do something to you. It's interesting. Y'all will start noticing that now, that next time it rains, I got 10 minutes. Next time it rains, look at your flowers before that. And watch what happens after that. I don't know. It's just like rainwater got some more, more minerals and nutrients in it. <laughs> hey, man. It even, hey, if y'all, I like the way rain smells. <laughs> Ooh, it ain't been through the world system. That's how when it comes down, it's so fresh. Come on up and it's so pure. Come on. God is trying to purge us with the rain. Come on up in here. That's why he said he reigns over us, right? He R-E-I-G-N, and he also R-A-I-N. Come on up in here. He showers us with blessings. Come on up in here. 
Hallelujah. Ain't nothing like it, y'all. I promise y'all. It's amazing. My wife, let me tell y'all something. My wife, my wife, I know you're watching tonight. Listen, I know she, she's got a, a tomato plant on our back deck. Well, that sister forgets to water it, right? So I went out, the, the, went out there the other day before it rained, and, I mean, it's just brown as all can be. I ain't see nothing on there. Ain't a, ain't a, ain't a tomato nowhere on there, Dante, nowhere. I went out there after it rained, y'all, I ain't got no lie to tell. I went out there, and it's like all of a sudden I see four uh, 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 tomatoes on it, and one of them done already turned red. I'm like, wait a minute. How in the world did this happen, like, almost overnight? I come to say something, prophesy over somebody tonight. God getting ready to do an overnight breakthrough in your life. He getting ready to give you an overnight miracle tonight. Come on. He's about to rain on your parade. Amen? God. And then I look up, then my wife got them tomatoes sitting in the house on the... P wife, if you're watching tonight, go take some pictures of them tomatoes or did I eat them up? I don't think I ate them. <laughs> Put some pictures on the uh, Facebook thing or something. Hallelujah. Y'all think I'm playing. I ain't lying. <laughs> I promise y'all, it was amazing what the rain, that all that it has in it. So I tell y'all this, tell you that to tell you this. What you think, write this down, what you think determines your pathway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so as a man thinketh, so is he. So what you think determines your pathway. Hallelujah. My wife said they won't let her post a picture. Uh, hallelujah. <laughs> how many of y'all want, uh, uh, Pastor uh, William said, uh, how many of y'all want God to rain on you, right? I know I do. I want God to rain on me. Right? All right. So, so what you think determines your path. Y'all write this next one down. The level of your faith determines your destiny. It determines also whether God is going to work and you know he's working. See, sometimes in your story, there have been times uh, that God has worked and you didn't even realize it. There were some accidents you should have been in, but he kept you from being in. Anybody ever been at a red light and you decided, and so somehow or another you got distracted for about two seconds, the next thing you know, a car, come on up in here. A car ran across the light. You're trying to think, God, thank you so much. Hallelujah. My God, what was they thinking? Anybody ever been there before? Shh. Running light, stop sign. They doing some of everything. Slamming on their brakes. And you look in your rearview mirror and you brace yourself, but they stop in time. I ask the hand of God. Hallelujah, Jesus. So, so what I need y'all to do is to think like Jesus. Somebody find Hosea chapter 6 verse, I mean chapter 4 verse 6. Somebody find Hosea, H-O-S-E-A, Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 real quick. Amen. And I'm about done, y'all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so I, I, I want to encourage y'all to, to just remember that this is your season to press. Right? You got a, you got a, somebody shout, I got a story to tell. So if you got a story to tell, you got to tell the story. <laughs> I got a story to tell, so I got to tell the story. Don't be afraid of your own testimony. Your testimony has power. Right? Okay, what does Hosea 4 and uh, 6 say? Q. Yeah. My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Now, my, wait a minute. My people are what? Destroyed. destroyed. From a, For a lack, lack of, knowledge. of knowledge. Right? What does it say? Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you. Wait as a minute. Woo! So God says, now, since you're going to reject what I got for you, then you leave me with no option but to back away so you can experience me not being there. I really don't want God not to be where I am. But that's part of my story. It's part of my narrative. Because of my hard-headedness, God will back away. Because I don't want the knowledge of Christ operating in my life. So God says, I'm going to back away for a minute. Go ahead, Q. So read it all from the beginning again. My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Uh -huh. Because you have rejected knowledge, mm -hmm. I also reject you as my priest. Mm. Because you have ignored the law of your God, mm. I will ignore your children. Mm. The more priests there were, the more they sinned against me. 
they exchanged their glorious God for something disgraceful. All these people in the church, people keep coming to church, keep coming to church, but everybody disregarding God. There's a bunch of us. There's a bunch of people in church, but yet we're disregarding God. And God says, now, when you get to a point to where you won't embrace my knowledge, then I'm going to step away, and then that means your children going to suffer. And now, let's look at this for a moment. Look at the world system today. Look at the narrative of the world. We just buried a 14-year-old because a 16-year-old had issues here. I don't know what was going on in her family life, but she felt like she had to take care of that with uh, violence. Back in the day, we used to fight, and then we'll get right back on the basketball court and keep playing basketball. Didn't have to worry about nobody stabbing us, shooting us, going to get a pole. You know, none of that stuff. We just, and then next thing you know, we go to the, to the corner store, and then we drink it out of the same bottle. We don't do that, that stuff no more now. But I'm just saying, back in the day, you know, we were just like that. But it's, 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 it's so different now to where the knowledge of Christ is not even in the home anymore. <clears throat> the word of God is not even being uh, shared in the home anymore. And we're trying to figure out why our children are so wayward. I mean, think about it. Th just on the 4th of July, a young man, I don't know how old this guy was, but he goes and shoots up people in a park. It's, it's all this devil devilish stuff happening. In the world today, look at the narrative. And that, I read something, that whether it's true or not, I don't know. But I heard, a, I heard, I saw something, I read something that said that they put prayer back in the schools. I don't know if that's true or not. I hope so. Supreme Court case. Well, I don't know, but I'm just saying I read that, and that's, that's going to be a good thing. We need, as a matter of fact, y'all need prayer back in your house. <laughs> not only do you need it in school, somebody said I need it in my house. If you ain't praying in your house, you need to start praying. Hallelujah, Jesus, because the enemy is coming in your house. He's getting any and everybody can. So as long as you keep pressing in God, right, and be the priest of your house, Right? What does a priest do? What does a priest do? The priest introduces Jesus. God, okay, let me let me let me stop. The priest introduces God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to his entire family. So if the priest ain't introducing his family to, to, to God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, so that means he's not introducing the knowledge, he's not receiving the knowledge of God, then now God says, You don't even want me in your house. And sometimes we got to be careful with our churches because our churches got so much smoke and lights and mirrors that God ain't even in there. I know I just lost some friends. That's okay, though. I ain't mad at you. <laughs> Maybe one day you'll come back. I don't know. Because sometimes when you speak a truth, you're going to lose some people. Be okay with losing people. Somebody put that in the comment section. Be okay with losing people when you telling the truth. Come on up in here. Amen. Hallelujah. We, we, uh, we, we in here because we, we pressing. We pressing toward the goal of the prize. We ain't just having church, baby. We having encounters. We having encounters with God because we want to see God get the glory, and we want God to be praised up in this house. And as I get ready to go home tonight, I need y'all to understand that no matter what's going on around you, you better learn how to press your way through. You need to keep pressing in your living. You need to keep pressing in your serving. You need to keep pressing in your giving. I don't care what nobody's saying on the internet. You better know what you believe. Hallelujah. And believe what you believe and stand on it in Jesus' name. I ain't caring about what people say when it's outside of the gospel of my God. Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus. And I'm going to stand on it. I don't care what kind of hell comes because God said I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. As long as you walk with me, I'll walk with you. Hallelujah. Some people don't want to walk with God because God will make you change. He will transform your mindset. He'll transform the way you think. He'll tra transform the way you walk. And some people like walking the way they walk. They, they like walking in sin. They like walking in arrogance. They, they like walking in jealousy. But I come to tell somebody tonight, that when I start pressing, you better start walking with me. Because if you don't, I ain't going to be mad at you, baby. I'll leave you behind. Some of y'all need to leave some people behind anyway. Because you keep on reaching back and trying to bring them back up here with you. God said, keep your hand on the plow and don't look back. I'm done with looking back. 
I'm keeping my hands on the plow. And I know God got a plan for my life. And I got a, another story to tell. Is there anybody in the building? Anybody online got a story to tell about how good God been to you? Do you have a story to tell about how God has healed your body? Is there anybody that has ever pressed their way through some stuff that people said, I cannot even believe you trust God in that? See, that's the problem right there. You don't want to trust God like you're supposed to. The Bible says to trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding and in all of your ways acknowledge him. What he going to do? What he going to do? What he going to do? He going to direct your path. That means he's a part of your life. And that means if God going to direct your path, he ain't going to let no devil in hell take you out. Because upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God got purpose for you. Now quit, quit giving up on God. Because God ain't giving up on you. Huh? Make your hands and your feet available to God. Hallelujah. Start trusting God at the next level. Pro start prophesying of your life. You know prophecy is real. You know when you start declaring some things, it starts coming to pass. But if you ain't saying nothing, ain't nothing going to be moving. Hmm. Sometimes the devil will tell, try to antagonize you and say things like, have you got it yet? Have you got there yet? Have you got the job yet? He's an antagonistic. He wants to be the main part of the story. But you need to let the devil know, no, you're not the main part of this story. The main part of this story is God. And I just got to wake up my own self because you will not win. I know what the Bible says about me. The Bible says, I can, I can almost just, I can almost just like start flipping the Bible. And, and, and the Bible says that, that uh, in the book of Haggai, chapter number two, verse number nine, that the glory of this latter temple <laughs> will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. I just opened up my Bible. That's what he took me to. <laughs> Somebody shout, I'm going to be better than I was last year. That's what he said. That's what God said. He said that, 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 he said that, that the glory of your latter house will be greater than your former. So you know how you were last year. God said this year you're going to be better. Then I opened up my Bible, y'all. I, I ran over here to Joel chapter number 2, verse 12 and 13. He said, now, now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Then he says in verse 13, so rid your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. <laughs> what did he tell us to do? Rid your heart. If there's some stuff in your heart that's making you not serve God the way that you should or not love his people the way you should, he said, let it go. He said, it's, it's more than how you dress. He said, because you can dress good. You got some nice garments on, but your heart jacked up. You about to walk out the door and have a massive heart attack because your heart's so heavy. Carrying everybody else's weight. God said, you better rid yourself of that. Some of us right now got, got on medication because you're worried about your, grand, your children. And so, listen, they grown. You, ain't, you can't do nothing about that. You got to turn them over to God. Right? You're worrying about some things that you need to give to God. Rid your heart of it. Let me just flip my Bible one more time. Bible said right here. He tells uh, Ezekiel, he said, now Ezekiel, I'm going to place you somewhere. And where I place you is a place where everything around you is dead. Everything is separated. Ain't nothing together. Some of us, God is placing in places where ain't nothing together. But he said, but when I send you there, this is what I need you to do. I need you to open up your mouth and start prophesying and watch how things going to start coming together. And the reason why some of us, that things haven't came together because you ain't prophesying. Ezekiel just obeyed the Lord. 
And when he did, the breath began to shift everything that was in front of him. And bones started coming together. Skin came on. Not, right? Everything that was dead around him came alive. Because he opened up his mouth, opened up his mouth because God told him. I wish you would open up your mouth when God, like God told you. Your children will be successful. Your business will work out. Yeah, yeah. Your ministry will not die. Especially if God called you to it. Because some people in ministry, when God didn't call you, uh-oh. I just lost some friends right there. And you're wondering why you're struggling because God said, I didn't call you to it. Anything God got his hand on is going to grow. <laughs> Let me say that. Let me say that one more time. Anything God got his hand on is going to grow. If God called it, he'll also qualify it and he'll also increase it every time. Father, I thank you tonight. I pray blessings, Father, that all of us got a story to tell. We got a story to tell about how good you've been and how powerful you are, God, and how much you love us. And God, we all got a story to tell about how you made a greater impact in our lives when we were sinners and didn't even have a relationship with you. And, and some of us just didn't want one with you, especially after some of the hurt that we went through, whether it through family, whether it be through church, whether it be on the job, whether it be best friends that turned their backs on us and we just... Couldn't figure out whether we, whether we lost a loved one or a child or a parent. And we're trying to figure out, God, why would you let that happen? And so we were mad. We were frustrated. We were angry. We were despondent. We were just not happy with you, God. But, Father, I thank you for sending a man, a woman in our lives to draw us back to you, that we will begin to grow in the knowledge of who you are in our lives, that we remembered about what you did for us when you gave your son to die for us. And then you said he ain't going to be there long, just three days. And on that third day morning, you rose him up with all power in his hand. Tonight, God, we surrender and we repent. We ask you, God, to forgive us of our sins and our unrighteousness, our transgressions, our doubts, our fears. God, forgive us of that. Forgive us, God, for not obeying your word. Give us another chance, God. We just, just give, us, give us another chance tonight for everybody that's listening, God. Give them another chance. So that they can tell the story about a man named Jesus that stepped in the middle of a car wreck and saved my life. So, God, we thank you. We honor you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Listen, y'all, God bless you real good. Remember, don't be arguing with demons. Put them in their place, tell them the truth, and go on and leave.